before I start on this, I just want to do a quick shout out to Mike, the Michael Myers fanatic. Be sure to check him out if you want good horror reviews where, you know, all the ridiculous stupid stuff that the characters do or that the writers wrote is, you know, mocked. Anyway, on to the movie. Oh, Sam, there's only one question that you want the answer to, isn't there? Why I never come back? Oh, or, well, yeah, Q is indeed anatomically correct, and yes, you can keep her. You were right about everything. The moon is green cheese! Okay, so I get that it was Clue who summoned Sam with the pager, and I get his overall plan. He wants the disc of Kevin, but why exactly did he try to kill Sam at first? Or, no, I don't even think he was trying to capture him. I'm pretty sure that energy was gonna kill him if Q hadn't intervened and saved him. Was that what he was hoping on? I mean, I get that they then found out where they went, but was he really just gonna keep circling him if Q didn't show up to save him? What would he have gained by killing Kevin's son? Did he hope that Kevin would become desperate and make a really stupid mistake and thus, you know, Clue could get the disc? Other than that, I would say Clue's actions made sense and he was smart, strategic. I do think that near the end, the bad guys had a little bit too easy of a time with... I mean, I didn't mind when they realized that they had to give chase and then they all had, you know, the flights, but then both Tron's and Clue's jet thing are destroyed and then Tron has another one. And I get that that's apparently the only one they have between the two of them and they struggle for it and that, once again, the great action, but I don't know, it seems a little too easy, you know? It's kind of when something is destroyed, you shouldn't just be able to pull out just another one, you know? There should be some kind of diminished transportational ability there, you know? I'm also not entirely sure that thing Q was suddenly holding. Have we seen that before at all? Was that, like, supposed to be a white energy sword version of the orange energy swords that the soldiers used in the club scene? I don't think we had seen her have one of those before. Anyway, when her disc was revealed to be the one that Clue got, was this supposed to be like them giving up, you know, ooh, this big cure that'll change everything? I mean, it had almost no effect on me. I recognized it. I realized that that was her disc and that that meant, you know, that they were giving up the cure. Excuse me. But it just didn't have any dramatic impact there. It was one of the only things that didn't have any dramatic impact. It was a little too... telekinesis thing with, you know... Kevin dragging Clue back, but I don't know. Maybe it's him hacking, and maybe he could do that in the first one. I don't know. I did like that he sacrificed himself just to make sure that Sam and Q could make it, you know, back to reality. And I really liked that this ended after spending an entire movie in cyberspace, virtual reality world, Tron. We have two people riding through, you know, the real world, and one of them just taking it all in, just loving it, you know, she finally gets to see the sun, that was really nice. And the whole moral of, you know, you think you have already achieved perfection, so you are afraid of any changes to the status quo, so when the ISOs arrive, a clue tries to destroy them all, you know, it's... I mean, there's a lot to Kevin's line of 
the perfect is unknown. You know, you have to take chances. You have to venture outside. If you say, this is it, this is, it'll never get any better, it's shooting yourself in the foot and, I mean, the implications of not allowing anything to change are horrifying. I'm not going to get into a big rant on religion in this particular video. I have others for that, but that is kind of what happens there. You know, organized religion says things are exactly as they should be right now, and they persecute those who try to improve, who try to change things. And it is a very totalitarian thing, you know. And that thing of, you know, Clue doesn't realize that you can't, you can't reach perfection, you can only reach for it. And that was because that Kevin didn't know it when he created Clue, and maybe Clue can't learn, we don't really find that out in this movie, at least maybe it was set in the original. Anyway, that whole thing really worked. And the thing of, you know, you have to enjoy the moment, you have to enjoy this life. You have to pay attention to your surroundings and enjoy what you already have. You can't always be thinking of, how can I improve this? How, you know, if I change this to that, would it be better than it is now? You know, there's that old saying of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If something is enjoyable right now, then think about, you know, just, just slow down and enjoy it now. You know, not everything needs to be a work in progress. Not everything somehow needs to be upgraded or something. You know, we forget that a lot today. And it's really sad. I think the earlier generations in primitive societies are much better at it than modern man. And I honestly think that a lot of us are unhappy because we keep thinking that it'll be better later on. And we miss things that are good and are right in front of us, and I'm gonna stop going into that now, because I probably lost half my viewers on this particular video. I think it would have been interesting to find out if everyone in Clue's army were reprogrammed rebels. Or if there was, if there was some kind of draft, you know, if... I think bringing politics into this would really have helped it. I think if there had been a clear group of people who were trying to rebel against, you know, the totalitarian regime... I did think it was fairly effective once you realized that Clue 2 was indeed going to bring everyone to the real world. You know, at first, I was trying to think of, wait, how is Clue 2 going to be a threat? I mean, he's just one man, you know. Is he going to have superpowers in the real world or something? But then, you know, if he brings that huge army with him, you know, and maybe their energy weapons, then we might have a problem. I mean, we don't know how big that army is. It would be kind of funny if they all had to go one by one. Just emerging from the back of this tiny little arcade store, you know, just... I... it makes me think of that scene in Life of Brian where, you know, first all the Roman soldiers go in and making a lot of noise, then they go out making a lot of noise. The whole thing of light and orange light, you know, for good and evil, it worked pretty well. Honestly, when Tron changed from orange to white light in the water, I thought he was gonna show up again and now be a good guy. be more or less it. I 
I think it was this one did a good job of occasionally introducing new technology that they were using in Tron and not having too much, you know, I mean, if you think about it, they have the discs, they have the light cycles, they have that other vehicle that can also drive on the, you know, off the grid, they have the small, you know, personal jets kind of thing, they have the big jet thing. When Jeff Bridges steals that, I thought that he was going to pull, like, a Jedi mind trick on the guy. You know, he, like, reprograms him or something, and then instead he just knocks him on the head. Um, they had those little, you know, glow stick swords. I think this movie could do wonders for the whole glow stick market. Yeah, they had a lot of weapon technology and that stupid little machine gun walking stick. And it wasn't too much. It wasn't so much that we were like overstimulated. The movie never really overstimulates. So, yeah, those are my thoughts on Tron Legacy in 3D. Uh, 